Hello and welcome to the Stained Glass Museum's online webinar this evening, Dating Nathan, the oldest stained glass window in England, given by Dr Laura Ware Adlington. Last summer, stained glass made headline news as the scientific research confirmed that the four figures of the Ancestor series at Canterbury Cathedral predated the 1174 fire, as first argued by stained glass historian Madeleine Cavanus in 1987. Dr Adlington was one of the leading scientists involved in this research, which made use of a few well-measured heavy trace elements and a 3D printed attachment for a PXRF spectrometer that facilitated in situ analysis of the glass. This led to the conclusion that the glass actually dated from circa 1130 to 60 and is therefore some of amongst the oldest glass in the UK. Laura's talk will introduce these techniques and the findings of this research recently published in a paper co-authored with Dr. Professor Ian Freestone and Leonie Seliger. Scientific research will be explained and placed in the context of what we know about Canterbury Cathedral and its extensive medieval glazing schemes, revealing exciting possibilities for the future analysis of medieval glass. Laura is a material scientist who specialises in the use of elemental analysis to study historic and archaeological materials, particularly glass. She's currently the technical specialist for stain optics in North Wales, Pennsylvania. She completed her PhD in archaeological material science at the UCL Institute of Archaeology in 2019, after which she worked as a postdoctoral research scientist at the National Centre of Scientific Research in France. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, Emily, um, for that introduction and for the invitation to speak in your lecture series um, and to put our research out on your platform. Uh, I've been really excited at the interest that people have had in this research. Um, as Emily said, uh, let's see if I can, there we go. Um, this work made the news this summer. We were really excited to be on the BBC, um, who did a really good job covering it, I think. Um, it's also been covered by a number of smaller special interest publications, both in cultural heritage and science, and even trickled down to more pseudoscience publications like this, which I have to admit the title of this one really makes me laugh, um, even though the, the content of it is a bit wild. <laughs> uh, of course, much of the research's nuance is lost in the reporting, particularly when there's a little bit of an overfocus on identifying the oldest stained glass window. Um, it's not so cut and dry as that. So I thought that that would be a good place to start this talk, is to set the stage for early windows. So first, let's just draw a line between unpainted glass and painted glass. Unpainted windows were in use in the Roman period, such as this uh, pane of window glass, which was excavated from Herculaneum, um, a Roman town near Pompeii that was also destroyed by the Vesuvian eruption. And in England, we also have unpainted window glass from Roman Britain. And a bit later, we have rather famous Anglo-Saxon window glass from the seventh century. So those glass pieces that are on the right uh, were excavated and later arranged into these windows. So in reality, we don't really have any way of knowing what configuration the pieces of glass were originally set in uh, and, and whether they depicted a figure or not. But of course, it's a very tempting reconstruction. Now, we aren't exactly sure when the use of Grisale pigment began. This is pigment that was applied to the glass, usually fired into the surface, and this is what they used to, to make the images on the surface of the glass. So the earliest fragments of window glass with Grisale include fragments from Italy, which have long been dated to the 6th century, uh, but a 9th or 10th century has been more recently argued. Uh, and we also have Grisale found in France, dating to the 8th century. Rather more complete groups of, of fragments, both depicting the head of Christ, have been excavated in Germany, dating to the late 11th century, and another in France, dating to the late 12th century. Now we move on to more complete panels. The prophets, pictured here, uh, were once thought to date to the late 11th century and thus hands down were considered to be the earliest stained glass windows in the world. Uh, but more recently, they've been dated to no earlier than 1132, but that's, that's still right up there for the early stained glass windows. Some panels from France may be slightly earlier than the prophets. They're from the 1120s or thereabouts, including the panel pictured here. But coming back to England, 
The earliest windows are usually identified as panels from the Ancestors of Christ series from Canterbury Cathedral. This series was created over decades with the earliest panels dating to the late 1170s. However, in the 1980s, as Emily told you, art historian professor Madeline Cavaniss made a case for the earlier origin of some of the figures within the series. So she suggested that they predated the rest of the series and were later incorporated into this Gothic glazing, glazing scheme. So her suggested date range for these panels is 1130 to 1160. So the aim of this research that we're going to talk about today was to test her hypothesis with chemical analysis. So here is our lineup for tonight. I'm hoping that there's a little something here for everyone. Um, we're gonna have some science, some history, and some art. Um, and first, we're going to discuss the chemistry of medieval glass. And I'm gonna give you an overview of how we can use chemistry to study stained glass windows. So I do plan to get a little technical here. I've tried to ensure that it's manageable, uh, but if science really isn't your thing, don't despair. Just bear with me and be assured that the rest of the presentation will be rather light on science, so I, I promise you. Um, so then we'll, we'll also go over the history of the ancestors' windows as we know it, talking about the glazing of the windows in the context of the cathedral's construction, as well as their movements in the centuries afterwards. And then we're finally going to review Kevinus's hypothesis its basis in art history, and we'll compare the results from the chemical data. We're then also gonna talk about the wider implications of the new dating of this glass. We're going to begin now with what chemistry can tell us about stained glass windows. The chemical makeup of glass derives primarily from the raw materials used in its production. Most medieval glass is what is often called forest glass, so it's made from a combination of sand and the ashes of trees and forest plants like ferns or bracken. So that's your basic recipe. Uh, we have a description of medieval glass making, as well as of the making of stained glass windows, from Theophilus, who was a German monk writing in the 12th century. Uh, research based on chemical analysis have corroborated the likelihood of his account. So this Forest glass recipe yields a glass with chemical composition more or less in these ranges. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of variability in the chemical composition of medieval forest glass. Generally speaking, compared to other glass types in history, forest glass has relatively low concentrations of silica and high concentrations of potash and lime. So also significant portions of magnesia, phosphate, soda, alumina, manganese oxide and iron oxides, as well as various other oxides, and there are also many trace elements not listed here. Theophilus also describes making different colors of glass. So although the term stained glass might seem to imply that the color is applied to the surface, the glass is actually colored throughout, except for um, special techniques such as silver stain, as you can see on this person's hair up here in the top left corner. That's silver stain. Um, so there's a couple of ways that they colored glass. One is by adding an extra ingredient. For example, adding a bit of cobalt to make blue. Another is to manipulate the furnace conditions um, by creating either an oxidizing or a reducing atmosphere. And this changes the oxidation state of the compounds in the glass, particularly those of manganese and iron. So this can create a range of colors, including green, blue, yellow, brown, um, purple, and pink, and I may have left something out. Then we also have flashed glass, most frequently seen in the creation of red glass, but it can be used to make other colors too. So this involves dipping the glass blowpipe into two different pots of molten glass, um, two different colors, and blowing them together in order to create different layers on the glass. And in this case, it's a colorless and a red, and these are just two examples, and we're looking at them in cross-section. So chemistry can help us understand a lot about stained glass, um, particularly related to technology and production. So topics include different recipes and coloring technologies used, furnace conditions and recycling. We can also look into the provenance of the glass or sourcing the raw materials used in their production. And when we look at windows, uh, we can endeavor to identify original versus infill glass pieces. 
Um, and it's also useful for understanding the deterioration of glass, which we'll actually get into a bit more later on. But how do we go about dating the glass? Well, generally the way to do this is through building up a chronology of chemical compositions to which you can then compare your sample. For example, post-medieval glass in England has been thoroughly characterized and related to developments in glass making technology through time so that these chemical characteristics can allow us to date glass. Depending on the size of your screen, this might be a little bit hard to see, but this is essentially a flow chart uh, made by David Dungworth, who developed this chemical chronology. So the first step is how much phosphorus is there? If there's more than about 0.3% phosphate, then you've got to plant ash glass. And you can follow this flow chart until you've identified the period of manufacture of your sample. Unfortunately for the medieval period, we don't have anything quite this cut and dried. But in England, we do have an interesting situation in that all of the colored glass you see in medieval windows was imported from Europe. This colored glass wasn't made in England until at least the middle of the 15th century. So we know this because there's no archaeological evidence for the production of colored glass at English kiln sites. And also there is a patent that was granted in 1449 to a Flemish glass maker. And in the patent, it states that the art of making colored window glass was not yet practiced in England. So although we don't have a well-established chronology of chemical compositions, a research group was able to identify regional characteristics in Europe. So this map, um, it, it, this map shows fine spots. So some of the glass will have traveled farther than others to their place of deposition and to the archeological record um, or to the, their place of continued use in cathedrals, for example, if we're talking about window glass. But there are um, chemical characteristics that are centered around known regions of major glass production during the medieval period. Namely, we have Normandy, the Rhenish region, and Bohemia. So this map shows that glass found in northwest France, close to production in Normandy, is characterized by higher concentrations of magnesia and lower concentrations of lime, while in uh, while Bohemian glass is characterized by lower phosphate and silica than the other regions. So why do we, why do we even have these characteristics? Um, there are a number of factors that contribute to that, but they'll include um, the local geography, which affects the chemical composition of the plants growing there, um, and then those plants are ultimately ashed for use in the glass as well as regional variation in the availability of species of, of different plants, um, as well as local technological traditions. Uh, but what that means for us in England is that when we detect different chemical groups, they're likely related to different sources or suppliers. Because remember, our colored glass, at least, is imported from Europe. So we, we can use this knowledge on a localized scale by identifying sources of glass used at a single cathedral during different periods of time. So, of course, identifying multiple sources can indicate that glass painters were using more than one source of glass at a single time. But if, uh, the, you know, the different glass recipes can be related to different dates at a site, then they can be used to date other glazing works. So um, it, it's the same approach, in a sense, as we use for post-medieval glass in, in that flow chart that I showed you, but it's just on a local scale instead. So we are going to apply this in, in this research by identifying different suppliers of glass, relating these to different periods of glazing, and using that to provide rough dates for panels. However, um, we have some other issues to sort out first. <laughs> Normally, we would want to remove samples for this kind of work. So here on this slide are pictures of a couple sample blocks. Uh, whereby small samples have been removed from window glass pieces, embedded in epoxy resin with the cross section exposed, and then that block is sanded and polished to a very fine grade and, and then it's ready for analysis. So this is just one method of sample preparation. Um, another involves acid digestion, for example, in which the sample is totally dissolved, but samples are usually necessary. But windows present a uniquely difficult situation in that they can't be sampled without dismantling the entire window. Um, and that is expensive and laborious and it just doesn't happen very often. So we need a technique that can be used in situ. So hello, handheld or portable X-ray flash and spectrometry or PXRF 
um, which PXRF can be used directly on the surface of objects to measure elemental composition. It's popular in archaeology and cultural heritage uh, because you don't need to sample an object invasively for results. So it's used in museums and on site on archaeological digs, as well as in laboratory settings um, where stakeholders are reluctant to sample fine art or delicate objects, for example. Um, however, depending on the material you intend to analyze, there can be some substantial obstacles to using PXRF. In the case of medieval stained glass, there are two primary obstacles. The first is this, the surface conditions of the glass, which is mostly deterioration. And then the other is, uh, are the lead canes, which are those strips of lead that hold the pieces of glass together in the panel. These obstacles, which I will describe in more detail, can simply prevent good measurements so that any data collected is actually meaningless or, or useless, really. So we set out to address these problems and develop a viable methodology for stained glass windows. So to do this, we really needed samples and we needed a lot of them. Um, and this, this was made possible with the help and support of the York Lasers Trust and the Dean and Chapter of York through collaborative research um, carried out at York Minster on the Great East Window, uh, which is pictured here. The so window had been dismantled for conservation and we were able to take hundreds of samples from across the window so that we could analyze them with various techniques of lab analysis, as well as analyze the glass with PXRF and, and compare them to see how they measure up. So for much of the work, we're able to analyze disassembled windows, as you can see us um, looking at this panel here. So what have we here? On the left, um, we've analyzed glass standards with PXRF. So standards are, are uh, modern made glasses, usually made in a lab environment um, with well-characterized and often certified compositions. So we know exactly what they're made out of. Um, we use them to test or verify our chemical analyses to see if our methods are accurate and precise. So in this graph, the PXRF measurements have a linear relationship with the known concentrations of the standards, and that is exactly what we want to see. Um, the slope of the line should be one, uh, but this can be easily fixed with calibrations, um, so we're not going to worry about that for now. So um, what this tells us is the method, PXRF, is working well. The problem becomes clear when we look at the graph on the right. This graph compares PXRF analyses of medieval glass compared to measurements taken with a more robust technique on samples mounted in those resin blocks that I showed you earlier with the cross section exposed. Um, so there is not a linear relationship here um, and we can't hope to calibrate this data or make it useful, unfortunately. Um, but what this tells us since it was working well in the standards and not well on the medieval glass is that there's a problem with the medieval glass. And the primary culprit is deterioration. So here we have a scanning electron microscope image of, of this glass piece in cross section. So the dark gray on top is just resin, um, the lighter gray, gray is the glass, uh, and the surface is right in the middle of the image. So you can see um, these like tendrils of deterioration extending from the surface into the glass, uh, and it's extending up to about 50 microns, and that's 0 0.05 millimeters, um, and, but that's still enough to be a problem. The medieval glass is very prone to deterioration on a chemical level. So there's certain chemical traits that make it more prone to deterioration than most other types of glass. Then we add to this the several environmental factors that drive the deterioration of medieval windows. Um, and the most compelling of these are rainwater and the wide variation in relative humidity. So you can even see on this slide severe deterioration um, where rainwater was probably diverted, probably ran along there and maybe even um, at some point sat, sat there for a little while before drying up. Now I always like to underscore the severity of this problem by pointing to the studies that have manufactured fresh glass with medieval compositions and exposed them to the ambient environment in several European cities for as little as six months and already deterioration could be detected. So as you can imagine, this is a problem for surface analyses. PXRF works by bombarding the surface with x-rays 
And then the elements present in the sample then release an X-ray that has an energy characteristic of that specific element. Um, and then the detector you know, detects all of those, it measures all of those, counts them, and it can relate them to the elements that are in the glass. So why, um, why am I getting so technical in a public talk? Well, the depth of the analysis depends on the element being analyzed. So this on the screen illustrates the depth of analysis for potassium and calcium, which are both read from the first 40 micron or so of the glass. And remember the deterioration here is going down to 50 microns. So potentially it's looking at the deteriorated layer only. Um, however, other elements are measured from much deeper within the glass. So the deterioration isn't as much of a problem for analysis. Now, all of the major elements in the glass that we would normally look at in a chemical study are read from relatively shallow depths in the glass. A couple of trace elements present in medieval glass and uh, they, they enter the glass by the ash and sand raw materials and so they aren't very affected by coloring materials added to the batch. So those can tell us about the same recipe groups that these major elements can. Um, they're also among the elements that are measured from deeper within the glass and so they aren't affected so much by deterioration. So therefore our approach is focused on the quantification of these elements and you can see this in practice here. Um, this is a panel from the Great East Window, and we have a lab, ana uh, you know, lab analyses on, on the left with potash and lime showing three groups, and then rubidium and strontium, which are two of these uh, trace elements that we're going to use, showing the same three groups. So we've now addressed the problem of surface conditions, um, but remember we have another obstacle. So we also tested the technique on leaded panels closer to the in-situ situation. Um, so many medieval window pieces are smaller than the face of the spectrometer. So the lead canes um, which hold the pieces together and also which stick out a few millimeters prevent the placement of the spectrometer directly on the surface of the glass. And this is a problem as you will see. Um, here we have repeated analyses of glass standards at increasing distances from the sample. As you can see, um, the distance between the spectrometer and sample result in decreased measured intensity. So what, what you're looking at is the measurements are normalized to the measured intensity at zero millimeters or um, you know where the spectrometer is directly on the surface of the glass. So when we get to about five millimeters away from the glass, the measured intensity is about 80 to 85 percent of what was measured on the surface. But that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that when you're analyzing a panel, um, the distance between the spectrometer and glass surface is variable between the different samples. So the measurements will be affected variably. And I'll show you that in practice. So here we have samples from a panel um, that had been disassembled. So we've analyzed these directly on the surface of the glass and the results show two chemical groups. Then we've analyzed them again when it had been returned to its lead canes. And as you can see, there is an overall reduction in the me measured concentrations, but some samples also are far more affected than others, which would lead to an entirely different interpretation of the results. So this, this panel too um, had relatively large pieces of glass um, and rather thin lead canes, comparatively speaking. So the problem would potentially be much greater when analyzing other panels. Now the good news is that if the distance between the spectrometer and sample is held constant, the decrease in measured intensity is consistent. So as you can see, there's a good linear agreement between the known concentrations of standards and the measured intensity, both on the surface, which is the graph on top, and at five millimeters distance, um, which is the graph on the bottom. What that means for us is that the results can be corrected in order to achieve better accuracy. So we designed a 3D printed attachment for the spectrometer and this just keeps the distance um, between the spectrometer and glass constant. Um, and there, there we go. So hopefully that wasn't complete gibberish, <laughs> but if nothing else, just take away this. This methodology uh, was developed out of research spanning a few years actually. And it means that we're now in a position to study in situ windows with chemical analysis. And that means um, that we're in a position to learn so much more about stained glass windows than was previously possible. So as promised, we'll now leave behind the chemistry almost entirely. 
we're going to move on and uh, review what we know about the history of the Ancestors series at Canterbury, Canterbury Cathedral. So the Ancestors series um, was originally made for the clerestory windows, which are located in that very upper level of the cathedral. The series depicted the ancestors of Jesus Christ with the portraits situated in pairs, one over the other, as you can see in, in this example. Now this lineage began with God and Adam in the northern side of the choir and carried on around the transepts and the presbytery and the Trinity Chapel, um, circling the cathedral to end with Mary and Jesus facing God and Adam across the choir. In 1174, a fire devastated the cathedral, necessitating extensive rebuilding works. We have a contemporary written account which um, describes the fire and the subsequent construction. So it's really useful for us. And we also have Madeline Cabanis, who came up with a detailed timeline for the glazing of the ancestors in relation to the construction works um, through examination of the glazing, the stonework, and written sources. So construction began in 1176, and the windows of the choir were glazed, keeping pace with construction, taking advantage of the scaffolding already in place. In 1178 or 79, uh, the architect um, William of Sens fell from the scaffolding and sustaining serious injuries. So eventually he had to return to his home in France and another architect who is referred to as William the Englishman took over the project. And he completed the transepts very quickly. Um, in order to allow the monks to have their Easter service in the cathedral in the, in the year 1180. And um, a temporary partition was put up at the end of the presbytery so that they could have their service. Um, now the glazing and the transepts continue to keep pace with the construction for this period. Now construction was completed within four years, but uh, from that point onward, the glazing no longer kept pace with the construction, and it continued on for about 40 years, probably completed in time to welcome the remains of Thomas Beckett um, to his shrine in the Trinity Chapel, and, and that was in 1220. Now the glazing uh, was, would have been interrupted by local upheavals, including disputes between the Archbishop and monks of Canterbury, um, resulting in a siege and exile at one point, and um, these took place during the periods 1188 through 1201 and uh, 1207 through 1213. Now it's important to note that the colors in the earlier phase and the latter phase differ a little bit in tone and hue, which suggests to us that chemically distinct glasses may have been used in these two phases. In the 1790s, the surviving ancestors were removed from the clerestory windows, adapted to rectangular panels where necessary, and installed in perpendicular style windows, including the Great South Window, which is pictured here. In 2009, it became obvious that emergency conservation on the stonework was urgently necessary, and the stained glass panels in this window, including many of the surviving ancestors, were therefore removed from the window to facilitate that work. This created an opportunity for closer examination of the glass, both by the public and by specialists. So in 2013, six ancestors traveled to the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and then in 2014 to the Cloisters at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And in 2015, they're exhibited in Canterbury Cathedral itself. Now, before they were returned to their homes in the newly restored Great South Window, I had the opportunity to analyze three ancestors as the first real test of that newly developed methodology using handheld px -Ret. Um, I will note though that I don't actually work in the dark. It was just a very cool, a cool photo. It looked cool. So finally, um, we can move on to testing Kevin's hypothesis. And so first we'll just start with reviewing that hypothesis in more detail. If you recall, she argued that four of the figures, which were located in the Trinity Chapel, and so they would have been installed about 1213 to 1220, are stylistically more similar to an earlier period. And one of these, as you've probably guessed, is Nathan, who is the subject of our paper. 
Um, and I really recommend that you read Kevin's paper for the full analysis. It's such a pleasure to read. Um, but I'll pick out a couple of um, interesting details for you. So a couple of practical points. First, that the figures in question are uh, too narrow for the clear story window openings. Um, they don't fill the space in the same way that the other ancestors do. So that suggests that there wasn't, it wasn't their original placement. Also, the name in the Nathan panel is, is cropped as if it kind of had to be squished into this canted square opening. Um, however, the bulk of the hypothesis is based on stylistic comparisons to artworks dating to the earlier part of the 12th century, including these wall paintings from the crypt at Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and they were uncovered in the 19th century, um, unfortunately deteriorated really quite rapidly after that. So examination is now mostly confined to early photographs and drawings. Now, these wall paintings are dated to about 1130 to 1160, and then they were boarded up around 11, uh, 1178. Cavanus points out several details in common, and again, I urge you to go read that paper. Um, but one thing in particular is the style of the drapery, which has an appearance of stiffness and defies gravity and is overall more Romanesque in style. And unlike the early 13th century Gothic glazing of, of the rest of the figures. Um, so if Nathan did survive the fire of 1174, Cabanus suggests the date of 1130 to 1160, which is based on the date of the wall paintings. Uh, an earlier date is not impossible. Um, indeed, the prior choir was described as resplendent with glass um, by 1125. But we're going to stick with Cavanus's date rage for now, um, as she absolutely seems to know what she's talking about. And as I said before, Nathan was situated in the Trinity Chapel and would have been installed there towards the end of the glazing works around uh, 1213 through 1220. Therefore, we also selected another figure from that period, Ezekiah, for comparison. And we also selected a figure from the earlier phase of glazing. Methuselah. Now, as I said earlier, the ancestors were moved to great perpendicular style windows, and in this process, many of them had to be altered to make them fit the rectangular openings there. Both Methuselah and Ezekiah were once at the top of their original windows in the clerestory, and then the frames around them would have had to have been disturbed. Um, and glass added in order to make them rectangular. So you can see this more closely here, the areas above Methuselah um, that were added and disturbed in the 1790s. So we're only going to consider the figures themselves when we characterize the glass in use during these phases of glazing. Now recall that the colors of the glass used in these two phases were observed to have differences in their hue, uh, which could indicate different recipes were used in the different phases of glazing. And indeed, when we look at the trace elements that we discussed earlier, the glass used in the earlier Methuselah panel and the later Ezekiah panel are chemically distinct. So the conclusion from this is that there was a change in glass source taking place sometime in the late 1100s or early 1200s. So the question is, what type of glass is Nathan made out of? Is it this later type, like the phase two panel um, that was installed at the same time, or is it the earlier glass, which predated the change in, in the glass uh, supply, or potentially it could be a third type? So we have both types in the panel. In this map of the panel, uh, blue is the earlier type, yellow is the later type, and gray is other mostly modern uh, glass. So um, let's, let's dive into this in detail. The original head uh, is now lost. This one is modern and we already knew that. Um, now the hat was identified as Cav by Cavanus as a Gothic addition. And indeed it's made of the later glass type. So it fits. It was therefore added during the, um, the period 1213 to 1220. But otherwise, the figure itself is entirely composed of the earlier glass type. 
This corroborates Cavanus' hypothesis in that it was glazed before the change in glass supply, not at the time it was installed. Therefore, we can support a pre-fire origin. So let's keep looking at the rest of the panel and figure out what parts are early and what are later. So the background behind Nathan is a combination of the earlier and later glass types. So the, the blue background, this sort of blue sky, uh, is mostly gossip, gothic, aside from one piece that we analyzed. Um, his throne, on the other hand, is largely early, and the stars are early. Uh, the frame is largely composed of the early glass type, about three quarters of that green border um, and the red and blue pattern. Um, and then the remainder is Gothic, so it appears that the pattern was copied and completed in the Gothic period with the rosettes added top and bottom. So they had portions of a frame surviving the fire, um, and then they, they copied and completed it in the early 1200s. Now this frame may have belonged to Nathan, or perhaps was saved from another pre-fire panel and they were combined in the 1200s. Um, the latter is maybe more likely. So remember how we pointed out that Nathan's name was curiously cropped. Um, so that brings up um, an interesting question, which is whether the banner bearing his name was also Romanesque. Um, if so, that points to an ancestor's subject matter in the pre-fire glazing scheme, and that would be quite exciting to discover. Um, so we analyzed two pieces of the banner with one early piece and one later piece, so the chemical results are inconclusive. Um, the cropping of the banner does seem to indicate it may have been early, so perhaps part of the name was damaged and replaced in the early 1200s. But overall, it appears Cabinus was very likely correct. Um, and, and this figure originates before that fire. And this invites us to ask why, why was it um, used in this, in this ancestors series? Well, one explanation is that this was a time and resource saving tactic in a period of great upheaval. Remember I mentioned there was a siege and an exile taking place during that period of time. Um, this could have allowed lesser skilled craftsmen to assist in the glazing. However, the panels must have been saved and stored for at least half a century, which indicates great importance and value were attached to that pre-fired glass. So it seems doubtful that that was the primary motivation. So this, this is where we dive into the concept of Belle Verrière which was a term used as early as the 15th century for windows that were saved from earlier, usually Romanesque or early Gothic buildings and incorporated into new, um, often Gothic architectural contexts. Now the window shown here is, I believe the most famous uh, with the upper part um, dating to around 1180 and the lower part, which is not shown um, dating to about 1225. Uh, and there's a very interesting paper by Mary Shepard uh, diving into the role and meaning of such windows. So in addition to their original iconographic meaning, um, as in here the Virgin Mary, uh, these windows would take on further meaning and significance as reminders of and um, as tangible links to the history and longevity of the building. So they signaled the building's own lineage and the unbroken succession of the church. And Unlike the act of recycling, which is arguably a mostly utilitarian action, the original artistry and imagery is maintained in these works of art. The importance of these Belverrières is highlighted by the window shown here, which in the 19th century was thought to be a Romanesque Belverrière, but is now thought to be Gothic glazing mimicking Romanesque style as if to claim that older origin and fulfill that role served by Belverrier elsewhere. Um, and and this, this underlines the importance of that role. So within this context, it seems more likely than not that the subject matter, matter of that pre-fire, um, of those pre-fire panels was preserved, um, but we have we have more information. Um, we have the testimony of Gervais who writes about the fire and the rebuilding. So he documents 
the efforts to fight the fire and to save ornaments within, and also the wailing and howling of the grieving monks uh, afterwards. And then he writes of the monks summoning several French and English craftsmen to give their opinions on the degree to which the building might be saved, because preservation was their core objective and appears to have been the original aim of the construction as far as we can tell. It has also been argued elsewhere by, um, by Sandy Heslop that the lower windows of the choir, the um, typological windows as they're called, are close recreations of that pre-fire glazing scheme. Um, and altogether, the evidence really seems to point to not only the pre-fire origin of the Nathan panel and, and possibly the others identified by Cavanis, uh, but that the choir um, that was destroyed by fire, which was described by Gervais as the glorious choir, not only contained these figures, but also an ancestor's subject matter and um, a subject matter that was then carried over into the next iteration of the cathedral. All of this together gives us greater insight into that pre-fire choir. Uh, it gives us this vivid glimpse into the past, which I must say is very exciting for anyone working in a historical field. Um, so in closing, I would just remind you that um, there's this other exciting takeaway from this work is the successful application of the in-situ methodology because this will open up many more possibilities for research, um, for discovering more about this beautiful and unique art form and craft. So on behalf of myself and my colleagues, uh, we'd like to thank the institutions on this slide for funding and other support. And thank you also to the Stained Glass Museum um, and of course, all of you for your attention. Um, this research is published and is available open access. I've included the, the DOI on the screen um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm sure we're all virtually applauding. Uh, I know it's, it's not the same when you can't hear it in the room, but I am sure across all corners of the, of the world that are joining this evening, everyone is, is clapping and thanking you for such an interesting talk. <laughs> um, I would remind everyone of the, uh, the Q&A function, which is along the bottom if you are um, on a laptop or a computer, and if you're on a tablet or, an, or a phone or anything like that, it's along the top, and you can pop your questions in there for Laura. Uh, I will kick off with the first question, if I may. Um, you talked about the sources of the glass um, and how you were able to identify the kind of geographic uh, locations. I wondered if there are, like, are you able to like, be, be more specific than that and, and suggest that glass has come from a very particular studio or maker, or is it too, um, too varied for, to identify particular people or studios? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not going to be um, the glass painters that you're identifying when you're looking at the chemistry, but the glass makers. Yeah. And, um, and at the moment, these seems to be pretty broad regions uh, that we're identifying. So um, we only completed this work a couple, that, that work a couple years ago. Um, and it, it might be possible to dig down a little deeper. Um, definitely, it is possible to kind of identify batches of glass. Um, when you're looking within a constrained context. Um, and so that could be one way that you might start to identify that. But again, that will have more, oops, sorry, more to do with um, the glass makers than the glass painters who are making the windows. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe someday. <laughs> do you think those, those concentrations would be um, geographic concentrations, i.e. lots of small studios working in a particular region of Germany, for example, or would it be sort of more general um, that it's like a whole a whole region rather than a more specific kind of um, towns, for example? Do you mean like are they independent workshops or kind of like yeah, I guess workshops? yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. The, I mean, that would be hard to tell from the chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is that there's going to be something a little bit in between um, that there's gonna be a little bit of a sort of guild situation that might handle um, sourcing. For example, cobalt is only found in a few places at that time. Um, so, you know, they'd probably all be using the same cobalt ore, but whether, um, you know, how closely they're working together, different workshops, we didn't know. Some people like to think that maybe different workshops specialized in different colors. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, the degree to which that is true is difficult to say at the moment, um, especially if they're like working right next door to each other. <laughs> so uh, that's hard to say. In, in later in later times, um, in the early post-medieval, uh, you do see some areas, especially um, focusing on making colorless glass because the Normandy region became quite well known for making really excellent colorless glass. But the degree to which that's true of the medieval period is a little harder to say. Thank you. So I will head to our Q&A. Uh, a question from Nicola. She asked if there is anything known about the glass painters. Were the windows made in Canterbury, London, France, Germany, etc.? So um, the, the window, I, I think we all believe it was made pretty much on site at Canterbury. And um, there's actually like a um, a little theory that that first architect, uh, when when he left, remember I said that the first architect fell from the scaffolding and then they had to change architects. There's also a change in the style of the painting. Um, and Cavanis talks about this in her papers. It's really interesting. Um, so there's a, a change at that, at that same time when he would have left um, that the glass painting also changes. So what that says to us is either the glass painter left with him or he was also the glass painter, um, which would be really cool. We really we can't prove that, <laughs> um, but it's fun to think of it. Uh, and that collection of glazing is um, attributed to the Methuselah Master because um, they're, they're just really beautiful uh, works of art. But I think, especially, just sorry, circling back to your actual question, um, that especially since uh, that first period, the the glazing was um, keeping pace with the construction of the building, I would say it was very likely made right there in Canterbury. And then I'm just checking the chat to see if we have any other questions there. Ah, we have another one come through from Rachel. She asks, does the conservation of the glass surface affect the analysis or is it affected in this case because of the trace elements you tested were deeper? That's a great question. So um, basically, yes, it, it must affect the analysis because it's still analyzing that layer. It's just analyzing so much more. So it's not, um, what it's doing is when it analyzes just a little bit, it's analyzing all of this. And when it analyzes deeper, it's analyzing all of this, um, if that makes sense. So it's not just like going down to here, analyzing this point and then coming back, if, if that makes sense. Um, so yes, it must affect it, but um, the Mo the vast majority of the uh, feedback that it's getting from the sample is going to be from that pristine glass. And in practice, it doesn't seem to affect, affect the um, analysis, the results. And there was a, another question from Joe, who asked, was the glass blown and then flattened? Is it ridged as a result? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, yeah, because I, we couldn't really see anything in the edges. Um, I didn't see any like moil marks or anything like that. Um, I'm not sure what the current theory is on how they were making the glasses, of whether they're doing the cylinder method or um, which the other one called the muff method. Um, it, it, I assume that's what you're asking about. So correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, I see that's down here. Yeah. I think that's um, I Yeah, I mean, they're like really, really quite good at it. I've, I've never been able to really detect very heavy lines like you see on pub doors or whatever. Um, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure which way. Lovely. Uh, we have another one from Alexis who asks, uh, who also says, uh, your correlation showed no wild outliers. Does that mean it was not recycled? Um, so we normally to detect recycled glass, um, there are some other elements that we'd want to look at and we didn't get any major elements for this class. Uh, you'd, so, um, no, I mean, I, I can't really say if it was recycled, but I don't think it was. I, I think they bought fresh glass and, um, and it, it would, yeah. That answers your question. <laughs> I think that was all of the questions we have had this evening. Um, but just before we conclude, if anyone has any last minute ones, you can pop those in the chat now. But I was just going to, um, I wonder if it will let me share. Uh, do, do, do. This, um, which is, oh, 
too many windows up. Uh, which is just about the Friends of the Stained Glass Museum. Um, and uh, just to mention that, that you can find out more information on our website, which is just the stainedglassmuseum.com slash friends. Uh, with that, you it's a, obviously a wonderful support of the museum, but you also get lots of benefits uh, by joining as a friend, including discounted tickets for our lectures and workshops and things like that, such as this this evening, um, and also a biannual uh, newsletter, which gives you more information about behind the scenes at the museum. So you can find Find out more on our website and also just to flag our final lecture in our autumn series which takes part next Wednesday on the 13th of October at seven o'clock which is about Irish stained glass um, and again you can find more information um, about that on our website um, and get tickets and things there as well. So if nobody else has any further questions for Laura which let me see if it will let me go back. I don't think it will, but um, I'm sure you will all join us in thanking Laura again for her excellent talk this evening. And uh, we will all give a final round of applause. Um, just check, I think we have, oh, sorry, there was one more question, if you don't mind, Laura, before we go. Um, somebody, uh, Alexis again asked, what's the effect of there being paint under analysis? Oh, really good question. Um, I didn't really cover that, but it it, it does affect the, the um, analyses and, the elements that affects usually is iron for sure, um, lead, and sometimes um, copper. I mean, Griselle is made from a couple of different things, but usually would have iron and lead in there. Um, and that actually, even if you're not analyzing right on the pigment, um, the, some of those elements can actually kind of disperse through the surface of the glass. So you can't really analyze lead, for example, in, in stained glass, if there's grisale pretty much anywhere. So um, those, that's another reason why we had to pinpoint literally just three elements that were well analyzed because so many of them were affected, not just by deterioration, but silver stain also affects it and the grisale pigment. Thank you again and thank you to everybody uh, for asking their questions this evening to Laura and I'm sure you will all join us in a final round of applause for Laura and we hope to see um, some of you at our lecture again next week. Thank you very much. Bye bye.